commission meeting, Thursday, March 19, 2013. Here. 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 allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have 1.2 adoption of the agenda as a motion. So, second. Second. Discussion? Yeah. Um, on the uh, policy for second reading, I think uh, 2510, uh, Mr. Petrie did make some changes there, which I'm appreciative of. So I can see how he made some of the points that were raised last week. But that should be back to the first reading since we did make those changes. Unless there's going to be some special procedure or reason to approve it on an expedited basis. Unless there's none. Very, very brief with all the changes that made because you don't have one. Just the just the rule that those policies need to be at uh, two consecutive regular board meetings before they're not. It doesn't matter. Uh, 
expect to have that set in by the end of uh, this week when we get in next week. The bylaws were uh, uh, written and presented to the uh, superintendent uh, on time as per the resolution. Uh, the instant bingo application, we've uh, decided to work through with uh, the local baseball team who happened to have a 501 c 3 for over two years and that was the Royal Blackhawks. And we had a to agreement with them whereby they'll sit there and obtain the license and handle the uh, sales of the instant bingo and then provide us with a 90 percent of the person. Seem like a fair the uh, liquor license application has been completed and it's been mailed, and we should be hearing something back on that in not too distant future. Uh, the general layout, uh, as you've seen, is uh, completed. Drive time party rounds are on board. They're just taking to drive tents for uh, the Ultra Fest, and we will plan on putting uh, an abundant uh, amount of tentage out there to protect us from rain. We've enlisted in contracts with Murray Brothers, again, the same people who provide the uh, cargo rides for Alter Fest. They're going to be bringing their stuff there, and that's why they've got those cheap road parking areas. They also bring with them their own electrical power supplies, so all we have to do is basically sell the tickets and then account for them and split the uh, money. And uh, we've got a, a 75 20 Finance meeting with the Alter Fest treasurer. They've been very helpful in uh, letting us know what we need to do and uh, giving us a general scope of the operation, which is you know, much bigger than anything we've attempted in the past. Uh, but it's given uh, our treasurer, Jen Mitchell, uh, some guidelines and uh, some things to think about. And uh, her, along with a couple other uh, certified public accountants, will be great to finance that better. And we'll know more as we lay that stuff out in the next month or so, how well that's going to roll. Uh, meeting has been on uh, food requirements. The tent of menu for that is the fish fry is going to be done by the Brothers Hat on Friday night. And Mr. Tommy Myers is going to lead a cooking crew cooking chicken and turkey legs and uh, corn on the cob on Saturday. The the music and entertainment is uh, tent that is scheduled right now. Uh, Heather Sucola is helping us out with that. She's uh, finding the bands that play well around here, and she's just going to get her sleeves, you know, offered the booking for us. So we've turned that over to her, and that seems to be on schedule as well. Uh, the logo's in development and should be ready to roll out in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'd like to ask that we kind of can keep the uh, the image and the brand of the uh, event. Uh, with one look to it, so that we can put it on signage, we can put it on banners, we can put it on all communication devices, as opposed to having everybody just kind of wing something off on the side like that. Uh, if we can do that, then I think that will strengthen everybody. Is there any questions? Wrap it up. Yeah. Please. Is that enough all good, information? All, all good news. Is that yeah. enough information? That's, that's that great. great. Thank you. Well, Anybody got any questions on any of that? Is it, is, Mr. Lincoln, is, it, is there anything we need to do to help you? Um, there is one thing that uh, we're getting to that point right now where the, uh, we fleshed out how many people and how many man hours it's actually going to require to put this on. And we need to start getting the uh, support of the school district to uh, help them out our uh, volunteer roles, uh, particularly the students that need to have service hours performed uh, for the Spring Grove High School. If we could get the uh, school principals to sit there and promote that idea, uh, I think a lot of those kids would sign on board. We're going to need roughly 200 and some people per hour for uh, a couple of days. So uh, some of those kids with strong backs and uh, bodies are going to be uh, immensely helpful. So I'd ask you guys if you could sit there and give them the, uh, the push on that. That would be greatly appreciated. We have a meeting tomorrow at 1 30 to talk about service credit. So the high school principal, Andrea, and Mrs. Dollar. And I'm all of that uh, was covered in that resolution, so we should be good. 
I, I don't recall the exact language of the resolution. Did we cover the volunteer hours and the service credit hours both? And that, yeah, both of them. So thank you the volunteers for his credit for service hours and uh, pay to play and uh, wherever else they're at. We already have a plan for the pay to play portion of the service credit hours we have to look at. We just need, uh, like I said, we need a lot of young bodies to do that, but I'm too old. Thank and we can that. arrange something to get to see if the staff wants to volunteer. Um, you know, we'll take volunteers from all of you people in this room. And there's something for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
that's why these things don't exist very often because it's a false sense of things are way high when really it's not because it's not realistic to take the budget divided by 12 and assume that you can stay to that budget each month because costs appear at different times of the year and we have expenditures in August and in January that were far higher than they are in the other months because we have an additional payroll each of those months. So. Sure, yeah, I, I don't know anything about the divided by 12 concept. I'm just trying to, it seems like this report is accurately reflecting some overage Perhaps not so 400 plus thousand by 1950. So it is a tool that is reflecting some hope. Mm -hmm. It does allow Thank us you. to kind of see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Well, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is for the rest of the transfer from the general fund to the athletics and subsidized athletic program. It's a $355,000 transfer that was approved in the five year. We've already done $150,000 earlier this year, and this is the other portion. And then that one, we can um, we have supplementals that we're paying next Friday, and then we have another round two that's coming for the end of the year. So this will pay for the help offset the cost of those for athletics. Isn't that the exact amount we, we did last year, too? Mm -hmm. Good. 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 So just to give you a little insight on this, the only did go back and look at it. And uh, in terms of the first paragraph about it's legally, uh, it's the legal responsibility of the Board of Education to approve all the textbooks, if I read all that to you. A lot of states actually have moved out the portion about the um, list duly filed with the superintendent of public instruction. Ohio is not one of those states. My thing is with that, it's unfortunate that the superintendent of the state of public instruction doesn't have the list online. Uh, perhaps he or she will in the near future. But that is one of the things I figured we'd leave so that when it is there, it's not something we have to change. The change that I did make to this, though, there was a question in the last meeting about the word only in terms of the superintendent only recommend. And then the next is. Um, where we have the book selection committee where appropriate. My thoughts are is this. You know, I don't get too bit out of shape about uh, who's suggesting it. The board says, you know, we, we would really like to look at Singapore math. All I'm asking is there's a committee made up of teachers, parents, and community members that view the books that I'm going to recommend to the board because ultimately what I'm looking for is what the teachers want to use, what the community and parents are comfortable with, and that's what comes to the board. So in short, any book that's suggested would have to go through that selection process. So that is really the, the main change that's taken place in this um, compared to last time. And this, po this policy did not go back to the committee. It's in the board's hands. So if you want something changed on that or you want to discuss that, feel free. Starts in considering the approval of any proposed textbook, the board recommends that the following factors be considered as part of the review process. And being on the board now for several years and having discussions on textbooks and reading some of the articles that have come out when, in particular, Texas uh, had four or five hundred parents show up to review adoptions of books and point out that some of the book publishers had errors in factual accuracy and it actually caused companies like Pearson to go back and rewrite their textbook to maybe 
make the historical representations in that example factually accurate. I think that's a really important aspect that we should be focused on as a district, especially in this particular section where we are actually giving the staff, giving the committee who's reviewing the books on our behalf, uh, an additional set of you know, intentionalities, I guess, that, that leads to an outcome. And I didn't see that get in here. We have this freedom from bias I discussed, and as much as I'm okay leaving that, I, I've heard more than one occasion over the last three years that textbooks have been biased for 100 years, one way or the other, so there's a bias there. So how we, how our committee actually, you know, takes that as a recommendation, I prefer to strike that, but I'd be happy to leave it. But I really think that accuracy, factuality, of, of the content that our committee is looking at, that there's some that there's some diligence put there as part of this guidance that we're recommending, and I would appreciate it if we can have either a letter J put into that effect or something, because again, this is giving this group of people that Mr. Petrie was just discussing another set of standards as to how they choose, and I think that's important, and and, it, and it's come out more in one article that there tends to be errors, whether it's publisher errors, whether it's author errors, whether it's whatever the error is. And, and when, the, when the publishers are notified, they, they have responded appropriately and made the corrections. So I, I, would, I would hope that we would, we would put that forth when we're educating our kids in the best interest of our kids and the information that they're learning. I think the reason it's probably not part of the list is um, who determines what's accurate? Uh, is 10 members on a committee uh, at, that say that, hey, this is an inaccurate fact and therefore we're not going to uh, support it? Um, accuracy is a relative item. So there are so many items that are not absolute black and white in terms of what's accurate and what's not. And especially in, in areas that are not necessarily perhaps science or mathematics. And, and so I, I honestly think the reason why accuracy is not on here is because it, it also can be very subjective. And I, I, I would trust the committee uh, to be knowledgeable enough in their subject area that they're going to determine by reviewing the textbook, by reviewing the materials, uh, what in fact is uh, is closest to what they believe to be appropriate and accurate. But uh, uh, as far as as far as that becoming uh, item J, if the committee recommends a, a certain book and someone on the board, the board as a whole feels, oh no, this point's inaccurate. Somebody's got to judge that, and who is that person? So I I I, I don't necessarily see. That, uh, that ought to be one of the items, one of the criteria. Yeah, Dr. Long, I know we'll always disagree on everything I recommend, so that's okay. But the same argument could go for bias. Who's going to determine bias? I mean, we can, we can go to every one of these items and have that factual is factual. If the Mayflower came over in 18X or 1720 or 1412 or the Constitution was written on X or, and it somehow is wrong, it's pretty obvious. Those are obvious things. I'm not going to really debate it with you. I just, I think you're, I just feel that accuracy and facts are important when we're educating our kids. I can see that's not important to you. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Petroni, but uh, that comment was uncalled for, and uh, I, I take exception at it. Uh, accuracy is important to me, but accuracy to you and accuracy to me quite likely are going to be two different things. It doesn't mean you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm right and you're wrong. Sure. Yeah, well, I, I guess, uh, you know, if, if the people who are doing the evaluation are evaluating the accuracy, I think they have to, right? Okay. What's the problem with adding it to the list? Um, and we have a number of things that are subjective. Um, and and uh, I think that at least if we have, say, say we have a history book and we have a history teacher on the team, I think that they're in a position to judge a number of these factors. Most importantly, the accuracy. I think that they would do that, uh, but I just think it deserves recognition on the list. Um, and so, some, somebody needs to make the call, and I think it's happening anyway. Um, I just don't see the problem. Can, with I, the can list. I just make a point to um, the, you know, the, the process, and we've been looking at it um, 
with the intention of, of trying to make it more comprehensive and, and supportive of, of, you know, the desires of the board. And, and one of the things we're going to do, and we're going to do that this spring, and would like to propose in the future um, for some consideration is to, to have once a month review of, of any materials that we will, would consider. And in that process, um, have in our documentation, per the evaluators of the materials, an indicator that that states, you know, some of those those um, you know those items, because I think in that process they do do that currently through their evaluation. So it's it's a practice that's already taking place. Now to say that everyone's going to read every single, you know factual information. Um, I can't say that that's the case, but what I can say is that, you know, I, I do believe that our, our teachers bring forward and we, we you know, do due diligence to, to review that so we can put that as part of our process um, as we evaluate. And I understand, you know, that you're, you're looking at something that's very um, concrete, but again, how is that going to be determined unless it's you know, you, you've got book companies that's supposed to have supportive uh, personnel to determine whether or not this information is reviewed and documented accurately. You know, we, we probably could challenge pretty much any book that's out there uh, to say that there's going to be some discrepancies with, with some of that information. So, I mean, I, I really feel like we're trying the best we can to put in some processes that will, will suffice that, that need to be accurate, if you will. So I think in that evaluation process, we can you know, have that from within that process. I don't think that's not something that hasn't been done anyway. But we can document that and we can have that documentation so that you can review that documentation if that's what you desire. You know, I appreciate that. Um, the, the difference that I see, because that's, that's down in the weeds, and as it relates to us as a board, we're actually delegating this authority, and, and as the delegating authority, this is a list of, of, of kind of board preferences, kind of. So, so the fact that it's a documented historical preference that you adopted policy and practice is wonderful. And this is, and my comments are not suggesting that uh, it doesn't happen. I'm just suggesting as a policy maker, which is what we do, that we be very emphatic and put and codify. So that in the future, when processes change, it's something that people can look at and say, hey, you know, not only do we have it in our process, but it's part of the board's agenda. So thank you. So I guess I would have thought that it, would, it was the obvious the concept of accuracy you know, would have been a, a, a given. Um, I understand that in those examples you gave where the, where the publisher then went back, and made the changes. Was it written or not written? Or do you know? Well, it was a. It was when Texas was adopting their entire uh, program. They actually they had a committee of it. It was literally a pretty Texas committee, so it was big. Yeah. Uh, and it was uh, foreign people from the families, and they found numerous uh, inconsistencies through that. But whether it was the parents or it was the teachers, and I don't have the specific date. You can probably Google it and see. The only point is, is that the obvious is there, but maybe it's there, right? And so if we were to add J, is, is that content accuracy? Is that, that, that part of what Ms. Strickler has added as a directive in her book get adopted here as a J, so that it, it comes out of the administrative side, it comes to the policy side. So that is kept for adopting. Again, you know, it's a Keep in mind, Mr. President, all our digital books, if at any time there's something in there that's inaccurate, uh, when it comes down to it, Mr. Regano in the last meeting, the board does implement curriculum throughout the district. So if there's something in one of our books that has to be changed with our digital products, we reserve the right to be able to do that. As long as it's not something subjective or we're going to rewrite something, but something factual. If the committee missed it and it came up and it was a parent come to the microphone and said, this is wrong, it was 1842, not 1850, then the board reserves the right to be able to 
to change that in Pearson in that contract. They do that. So there's always safeguards on some of the forms to some extent. Or if there's something in there that doesn't meet the values of this community, you can take it out, which it's a little sketchy, but you are able to do that. Like with the digital product. Quite subjective, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Censorship the, is a law, but uh, there, the, you do have some when it comes to community values. Mr. Ashton, I agree with you. I think it's pretty obvious that we're interested in the accuracy and the correctness of the materials. Why we all have left it off their list, I don't have a clue. I'm just suggesting that, that it's it's an obvious thing that should be on the list. Um, I think we've debated it more than it deserves to be debated. I would just suggest we add the item to the list and, and go on. But um, uh, and just in the interest of, of the policy being precise. Uh, back on the issue of this uh, no textbook will be approved, which is not on the list duly filed in the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. You know, out on the OD website, there's this page, and, and they've put it in big bold print at the top of the page. Ohio Department of Education does not approve textbooks or maintain an approved textbook list. If we were to adopt this policy and, and by the letter of what we adopted, we would never adopt the textbook because this list doesn't exist. And so uh, I just point that out for consideration. Okay. Uh, just interested in the policy being protected. Well, since that's first reading and it's at the board level at this point, I think they can contact the two of us and then we can work on it before the next that board meeting for the second reading, which is typically how we do our other policy and things. Contact the facilitator of the policy committee, and those discussions take place in the policy committee. But this did go back to the committee at the board level. So, so, you, so you can contact Charles and I about the different things about this. I'm on record. I, I'm on record for my own thing, so you guys can figure out how you can do it. And technically, I, I need to have something in writing that is contrary to its own public. But <laughs> you know, it just the facts are in there. We need the first or last time. Yeah, I know. Well, I think we have to tell us about it. Let's go on to item 4.2, first reading. This is first, I apologize, I lost my page. First reading of the early entrance policy. We did take this one to the committee. Uh, Ms. Strickenberger and uh, Ms. Cook have worked a lot on this. They presented it to the committee, took some feedback, and then submitted the final to me, and that's what you see here today. I definitely will defer to Ms. Strickenberger to answer any questions you have about this. All right, well, what we did was um, we took um, policies uh, 5112 as well as 5408 and, and looked at uh, the two of them as, as they kind of had some, uh, um, they kind of coincided in, in some areas. And so what we did was we took the early entrance age policy and basically pulled out some of the language that was duplicated in, in the uh, 5408. 5408 was, um, which is the academic acceleration early entrance to kindergarten and early high school graduation. And that was revised in 2014. And the, the early entrance, uh, what we looked at is some of the duplication that was in that policy and some of the uh, language that didn't necessarily need to be in the early entrance policy and pulled that out. And then what you see in the red is basically a, a reference to this particular policy, which is the 5408, and just kind of assured ourselves that we were meeting specific requirements for early entrance. So we wanted that policy, the uh, 5112, to be very specific to early entrance. So any changes that are in there, which are in the red, um, short of what was struck out, we, um, we added in to assure that we were meeting the requirements for early entrance. Is there a motion? So the discussion, questions? 
just a question on evolution. Again, not maybe. Um, and I, I, this C, this paragraph C under the advanced placement in grades, this social, emotional, behavior skills, is that something that we don't do or that we do automatically but we don't need it in policy anymore? Or I'm just curious on the on the deletion of the to be considered in the ABC. Well, we, um, you know, we don't want to hold children <coughs> out for anything that is, I mean, it is, is part of the uh, process, it's part of the evaluation. Um, of early entrance, but it's not um, it's not one that is quote required or not required, if you will, for the early entrance. Um, it is a consideration, obviously, but it's not one that is specific to meeting the requirements to um, for early entrance. Mr. Petroni, if you read the research on grade level acceleration or subject acceleration, uh, what they're finding is the United States does not accelerate students enough. We hold them back because we always take into the maturity. When the really maturity should not be taken in deeply into consideration, we should be moving kids forward based on their ability. That's one of the things about that. So some board somewhere, just in whatever year this was, thought this was a good idea. This was a passion this was. They've done a lot of research. The Iowa Acceleration Tool had a lot of research behind it. And over the last 10 years, they've come a long way in the research of what truly gifted cognitive means. Yeah, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all for it. It's more than just kids who do all work. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, I, 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 appreciate, I appreciate your point. Um, I'm just trying to understand from a policy perspective why some things in here aren't good to have. I think are you're saying it's operationally, not policy, is what you're, what you're saying? Because yeah. well, somebody thought this was a good idea. I guess not, right. That's all I'm before my time. So it's op operationally correct. Okay. Okay. It aligns with the, the tool that we use to accelerate students. Okay, gotcha, yeah. thank you. Yes. Thanks a lot. Any other comments? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, okay. 4.3 approval of donation from LexisNexis to Benavidi. Let's put that out. Community Impact Fund. And this is $50 from LexisNexis. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Roll up. Yes. Attorney? Yes. Malone? Yes. 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 Four point. Four, this is my recommendation to approve a donation from Springboro Athletic Boosters for $14,420 for a new pole vault landing pad system and $980 to purchase new boys' tennis uniforms. Is there a motion? So moved. It's my recommendation to accept donation of $813 from the 2014 5th grade class at Dennis Elementary to be used at Dennis Elementary where you come. Second. John Pennell, business manager, to 260-day contract, effective August 1st, 2015, uh, expiring July 31st, 2018. Your motion. So moved. Second. Second. Yes. Attorney. Yes. Hello. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is approval for contract renewal. <laughs> Three-year contract, 220 days, effective August 1st, 2015, commencing on or ending on July 31st, 2018. 
Yes. Board of Point it's my recommendation to award a two year loan of the contract uh, to Brooke Coulter. She's the assistant principal. It'll be a two year contract, 220 days, effective uh, August 1st, 2015, ending July 31st, 2017. So My recommendation to award a two year limited administrative contract to Mr. Michael Myers, assistant principal, two year, 220 day contract, effective August 1st, 2015, expiring July 31st, 2017. So moved. Second. Second. Yes. 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 4.10 is my recommendation to award a two-year limited contract to Mr. Matt Lewis, athletic director, the two-year, 260-day contract, effective August 1st, 2015, expiring July 31st, 2017. Motion. Second. Second. Yes. 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 4.11, this is the uh, approval of the Springboro High School band to travel to Florida March 26th through April 2nd. The trip is funded by the band boosters. Is there a motion? Second. 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 Disney World. I'll put it right. <laughs> Disney's Performing Arts on Stage, Universal Studios, Harry Potter, Cocoa Beach. So they're going to have a good time. And the whole itinerary. Yes. 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 Okay. 4.12. Uh, approval of revised services with the Warren County Educational Service Center for 2014-15. Some of the changes you will see is the social communication classrooms. It is $42,525.88 per student. Um, and yes, that is one of the main changes. Also, our SED unit seats, we have added another there as well. So as our population is increasing to some extent, our special ed uh, population is certainly increasing. So, second. Second. Um, just a question. Is this the only provider of these services available? You know, some we could bring some of these in-house, and Mrs. Benson is exploring that. The thing is, we really don't have enough kids yet to be able to do that because if you brought, for example, an SED unit back into the district, you would probably need two teachers and three or four eight. I mean, these are uh, severe need students, severe. So uh, it takes a it takes a considerable amount of staff to bring them in. If we got to where we had 15 or 16 students who were SED, it would probably be cost effective for us to bring kids back into the district. To also answer part of your question, although we are looking at how to support more of our students in-house, we all, to answer your question, yes, we do have other providers. We go through Montgomery County ESC for some of the provisions, and we do have some other, like ABS, which is right outside of Springboro, um, deals with some of our uh, severely autistic students. So I'd be happy to provide you with a list, but yes, there, it, is, it is not solely Warren County, if that's the question. Was it second and a half, just more of a question, thank mm -hmm. you. Just another mathematical question on, on occupational therapy. Is that 130 days or 13 days for teachers? 130, I believe. Because what we do is we are, we hire our own speech people in our for our services, but we have OT and our occupational therapy and physical therapy through Warren County. So it'd be 130. It's not 13. Okay. So again, I do. 
coming in, Mrs. Benson, she has went through and looked at other options for this, but we're still right at that line of we just don't have enough yet to branch off into doing these ourselves. I've worked with districts in Preston, Lakota, they have a lot more kids, and we have these in house with that ability. So we'll get there for the next two or three years. So, since you pointed it out, Mr. Petroni, I'm not understanding that table that Mr. Petroni just referred to. For example, physical therapy is on there, seven days, $114,000. The, the treasurer lady might know because she goes Sorry. over these very close. Go ahead. It actually, it, it, I, you're right, and you're right, but it is, it is uh, right. double right. Well, it's In other words, both of you are wrong. She's been there to tell you what's right. <laughs> Yes, it's okay. it's that many days per week. So you've got five and one teacher five days, another teacher five days, and then the other two that has three days. So you've got two to four. Well, it's not like seven physical days. Yes. It's 13 days. And I think 40 to do that because I want to change jobs if that's the case. <laughs> Some of these jobs now, especially schools, <coughs> they get paid very well. <coughs> that's been a real trend lately. data and also the amount of Title I funds that we were provided this year that we are able to hire somebody to give some extra support for our at-risk kids. education for a school psychologist. Um, we are getting to be very well known and not only do we hire great people, well, we rehire people. Uh, this is Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Shell. She used to be at the high school. She retired. We're rehiring her for two to three days a week at the junior high for the end of the year to help out with the rest of our ETRs for our special education students. anywhere from five to 12 hours to do the testing, which takes a few hours, and then the write-up of the actual paperwork that we need for the state. I was just curious what the data areas based on. If you want that job. No. <laughs> <laughs> just look at the ad and just trying to understand what you're looking at. 
5.4, the same approval of the personnel report. For the superintendent, we are asking approval of 15 items. I would like to point out item one, that's approval to accept the certified retirement of Molly Ray. She's a high school health teacher. Um, over 30 years, she wrote the nicest resignation letter with pretty little pictures and everything on it. Um, she's very excited, but is just a stellar teacher in this community. Um, has done a lot of things for the high school. I know as Dr. Malone knows, um, has run a lot of the clubs. Um, and does a lot for the Alumni Association. Uh, so we wish her well um, in her future endeavors and thank you for all of her uh, years of service to Springboro. Also, we do have approval of accepted certified resignations on item two. We have two for resignations for classified, one supplemental, and then we have approval to employ five substitutes through item 15 for your approval this evening. Motion. Second. 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 Question. Yes. It's about substitutes. Aren't we, when you say employer, aren't we doing that? Uh, isn't there a service that we contract out to do? Is that to change? We use the service through Moore County for our teachers, but we do not for our classified people. Gotcha. Tonight I'm asking for approval to revise the high school summer school brochure and it is adding a position and that's to revise and add a position for the financial literacy. As you will recall that is a credit that we have to ensure students get in order to graduate. Is there a motion? So moved. There a second? Second. Roll call. Yes. 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 some specific details that I'm able to come back to you and put dollar figures next to. First and foremost, the savings from the uh, consolidation, we have been able to work the schedules at all the buildings. We will not need to rehire the retiring art and two PE teachers. I calculated a savings of $825,000 over five years at $55,000 each. And the five-year forecast, to be exact, their salaries are roughly $270,000 per year for the three people. But what I'm looking at in my mind is where we're at. So that's an $825,000 savings over five years. And I can tell you, if you're a betting person, I seriously doubt we'll have to hire another art, music, or PE for a while based on how we were able to adjust the schedules. Um, we also were able to reduce the three sections, two second grade sections at Dennis and one third grade section at Dennis. If we would have redistricted, we would have had to have hired all those people back to be able to <coughs> consolidating all to one location, kept the number small at Dennis, which were too small to begin with, so we were able to reduce those three positions, which will also be an $825,000 savings. Now, as you know, my job, being the superintendent, is to drive the core instruction of the district. And two areas that we truly need some staff is a fifth grade position at five points. So one of the three sections that was reduced will move to five points. Their class sizes now will be 26 or less next year. That's a huge drop. Also, uh, and for a couple board members who have been on here, you haven't heard about Spring Grove Intermediate in a while, we're also going to be able to add a teacher to Spring Grove Intermediate, which will drop their caseload from 168 students per team to about 115 students per team. In my career, the way we were able to change up SI based on being able to share teachers with the first grade building, they're actually going to add 30 days of instruction back to this building because they'll no longer be required to take a study hall every day. 
they'll still have art, music, PE, or study hall, but it'll be a five-day rotation. So it adds a lot of time back into the day, and now they'll have four teams instead of three by adding one teacher. So that's been a real blessing to that building. And if you look at our district data, that's the first time all of the kids come together in the district, and their data has somewhat struggled. And that's not as a result of the teachers. The teachers there are stellar. I love to meet with them. But when you look at value add of truly moving students, one full grade level, when you have 30 kids a class and 168 kids on a caseload, it's very difficult to differentiate for that many kids. It'll be much more manageable now with 115 students per team. So I'm excited for them on that. Also, we uh, know now we will not need to hire another special ed teacher at five points, which is clearly a savings of $275,000. And being my comical self, the operational right side, and we're already seeing it, is priceless. Because uh, all of the caseloads of the people who see the multiple kids, the classroom sizes, our specialist teachers will actually get a full plan because we were able to distribute the kids amongst the grade levels equally and balance everything out. So I think we'll see our buildings running much more efficient next year. Next slide. The updated costs. Special Ed, and these are costs that would have impacted the five-year forecast. Uh, we have a retired teacher at the high school in Special Ed we're not going to replace, so that person will go to the Early Learning Center. And that was a position we added this year and we found out we really didn't need that, so we will be able to transfer that person to the Early Learning Center. A .5 counselor uh, was already figured into the five-year forecast, .5 speech figured into the five-year forecast, and a .5 school site. And those are things we may end up not needing, but right now our numbers are showing us that we will, so we could potentially not have to do that, we'll see. The modular unit, um, in my opinion, this turned out to be a, a nice surprise. We had budgeted 50000 It's coming in at $56,000 a year for the lease. The difference is, in eight years, we will own the modular units. Also, it will be placed on the ground level. And I have some pictures in a moment I, I want to show you. And lastly, the transportation is going to work out the way that we thought. The difference is, the start time for the Early Learning Center will be 10 minutes later than it is right now, which means 4.05 which is the exact same time the Early Learning Center I ran in Lakota, which was 405. So in order for us not to have conflicting bus routes, we will need to push their time 10 minutes. But the, the, the students should still get home at the same time because the routes will be short. So they should not be on, they should still get home before 5 o'clock. Right now the, the draft plan does not have any student getting home any later than they're getting home now. Good, thank you John. This was the original rendering that we showed you. And if you notice, it is off the ground. This is your typical modular unit. Even though it has the ventilation and some of the walls are built, built, built down, this was off of the ground, up the heated stairs. You go to the next slide. What John was able to work out is the buildings that we're going to get will have a full, fully poured foundation with drainage under it, just like a house if you were building a basement. A lot of homes built in Springboro built with this same um, technology. They build the foundation, but they bring the house in on a truck and assemble it on site. It's not stick built on site. As you can see, they will bring in then the foundation, as you see, fully insulated, the proper structure, pylons, all the drainage, and they will set that on the foundation. So this will be a fully functioning building. This is a particular building that is exactly what we're going to purchase and own within eight years. Uh, this is an MRI clinic somewhere in Indiana, from my understanding. You surprised I remember all that? Yeah. And, but the, the other key about this is we will have the brick veneer on these buildings that will match the, the brick that's on Clear Creek now. So it will look like part of the building. Each room is roughly 32 <coughs> by 32, which are large. We'll have four classrooms, it'll have a designated hallway, secure entrances. We're still working with the city and the county on a 20 foot, uh, which is about the size of those two tables right there, maybe a little longer, covered walkway uh, that's fully enclosed and heated so that the kids are able to come and go and use the restroom. The update summary as far as materials, uh, we had budgeted $40,000 for smart boards. Some of these things are unknown at this point. We're going through and evaluating what we already have uh, some of our products are a little bit newer in some of the classrooms at Dennis and Five Points. We may move some of those. 
Uh, we haven't met with the first grade teachers and gotten their feedback on what they would take and not, not, don't want to take necessarily. Document cameras, projectors, furniture, um, all of those things. Actually, Mr. Pinnell's crew from Jonathan Wright, they had some cubbies over there that are relatively new that they've been able to take over or put into the first grade. So we've been able to use some of our resources already without creating the cost of the district. The installation of this will be $75,000. We have budgeted 50 to 70, so it will be a one-time cost of $75,000 for the insulation, which is pretty reasonable considering a 2,000 square foot basement this day and time is about $35,000. Um, moving staff will be about $10,000. The teachers will get a $250 stipend for the ones that we're requiring to move to the first grade building because those are we just told them you will be repositioned. So they will get $250 to move, which if you've never moved a classroom is about a four day process, uh, especially in first grade because they have rugs and knickknacks everywhere in the world. So it will take some time. John's already ordered the boxes and it's, they're good to go. Lastly, the kitchen update, 75,000. It's coming in right from the fall. Any questions on any of that? And John will talk to you more about the contract. The only thing that seems different is we're now owning this building forever because I remember this was a temporary decision that we can eliminate the property in time. But to do this, a regular lease was still in the, the low 50s to high 40s, and at the end, you owned nothing. For six to $7,000 more, we were able to own it in the end. John, would you like to talk about the lease itself? Yes, uh, Mr. President, members of the board, for your consideration, I'm recommending approval of a lease purchase of a 64 foot by 72 foot custom building from Pac Van Incorporated to be installed at Clear Creek Early Learning Center and in the amount of $75,000 of installation cost to Pac Van and a monthly cost of $4,704.96 per month for 96 months to key government finance. Is there a motion? So moved. There a second? Second. And the, the reason that we went and decided to go with the, the module that we did, by the time we looked at um, the getting some uh, single double wide or, or two double wides out there and then enclosing them, having an enclosed walkway and all that, or getting a, a, a standard building like this up on the pylons and then having to add the ramps and everything else the amount of the cost was so little difference between the two um, and when you look at this uh, uh, the 5,000 square foot building is right around a hundred dollars a square foot for something that's going to be there as long as we upkeep it just like we should upkeep all of our properties it should be there 50 60 years uh, the HVAC unit will be on the roof so there will not be the HVAC units hanging off the side. It will be a regular building. Um, there will be no water in the building, um, but that's why there are restrooms that are very close because some, some of the students actually have to walk a little bit farther from some of the classrooms now than where they'll have to walk from this building. So, um, and we need the, the approval now because we've got to get the process started. We've got to get through um, the zoning department. And we've got to get, get it built and installed before the 1st of August. Mr. President, members of the board, for your consideration, approval of our lease uh, with Mike Farm Enterprises for um, them to be able to farm 14.24 acres um, up at five points at uh, $110 an acre for a total of $1,566.40. This is uh, last year was the first year that we got money for it, and this is the uh, exact same contract. So, second. Second. Just a question. 
Just quick. Um, I was talking to a realtor. Um, have you asked what the going rates are for leasing and farm to any realtors that might be in that business? No, I did not. Have not. I mean, it's it the basically my I. I talked to a couple farmers, and this would be a reasonable rate. Um, one, one of which was, you know, the the Henderson folks that that uh, you know they they do the you know they don't do a whole lot of farming and stuff now, but they've got the the um, sod business that they've got. But you know they they rec they see this as an average going rate. You can get more, you can get less. It just depends. It's a fairly small lot. I mean. 14 acres to, for, as part of a farm is, is not a whole lot, and that's one of the reasons why it's not a bad rate, because it's a, it's a small set, actually. I'm just farm. curious. I, I seem to have talked to somebody about values for sales, so maybe the difference between sales and right. sales seems a little bit higher than that. Yes. 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 Mr. President, members of the board, for your consideration, I'm recommending approval of a building use form for Clear Creek Professional Firefighters Association uh, for August 29th, 2015, for the auditorium and the commons uh, to do some professional development. And I'm recommending that at, at no charge. Second. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to board member reports or comments, Mr. Stubby. First of all, are you okay? send out things about the Borough Fest uh, through our email. We have 20, 30,000 people a day that get our email that are going to see some of these businesses' names that support the Borough Fest because the Borough Fest supports the school district. So that is something to think about. Spread that word. If anything happens, call me, and I'll have them either speak with uh, Mr. Bruner, Mr. Ziegler, or Mr. Wiedemann in terms of uh, sponsoring the Borough Fest. Uh, 
but this I think it's going to be a great event for this community. This community needs that. I think it's going to be a fun time for everyone involved. Not at this time, Mr. President. Yeah, we'll convene for work session and uh, take five minutes. Um, Mr. President, members of the board, just for discussion today, um, the, um, the gentleman from Side Effects came to us um, a couple months ago um, with a recommendation that we, we um, create apps for um, the district and maybe the schools and all that. And um, we uh, met with him and uh, the gentleman from Fast Apps. Um, to look over what they have, and Karen DeRosa was was in with this and did, has done a tremendous amount of work on this. Um, so we're at the point now where we're ready to push forward with it. Um, and so, because it it is a an additional contract that has side effects involved, that's why it's being brought to you. Uh, because any of the um, additional sponsor type things that that side effects do, does will be an addendum to their contract. Um, so that's what this will be. Um, and this, this um, addendum, basically, what they do is they'll be taking a certain amount of um, money um, from the advertising directly to the company Fast Apps until the, that company has paid back how much they put into developing the app. And at that point in time, then it comes, starts to come back to us. Um, so the first um, attachment there is the, uh, is the contract, the addendum with side effects for that. Um, you'll see the second thing that's, that's on the uh, board agenda is the projected school revenue. Um, and that's based on, if you look on the, uh, the screenshot there, uh, we believe that those screenshots are a little bit more percentage-wise ads than what we've seen and what we would like to see. Um, based on that, if you look at the home page, it's you know 42.5% ads, and that's not what we've seen to this point, number one. Number two, I don't know if that's enough that, I don't know if we'd sell that many ads anyway um, to get that. So those are the things that Karen DeRosa is working very hard with them on. But if you look at uh, their projections for that, once you uh, take out the revenue and the setup costs and what they would be charged um, from fast app um, and the cost for that you can see that the um, the possible revenues are somewhere in the 13 to, to fifteen thousand dollar a year range uh, for this app um, it's you know we're still in the um, the fairly early development phases of this so we still got a long way to go but that's why we wanted to get it 
out in front of you now um, to see if you had any other questions or any concerns about uh, the contracts that we're, we're looking at trying to do. I just have a, I don't know this business very well, but I'm, I'm thinking about people that develop apps and then try to sell them to people to buy or sell the service. Correct. It sounds like we're paying for the development of the app versus buying the output of the app. Correct. Right? Well, the, yes, basically, in, instead of us taking general fund dollars or, or money from the district and paying for the app, Basically, they're creating the app, and from the revenue stream, they're going to be taking the amount of what would it cost for them to develop it. Yeah, there was an article, um, was it Cedarville seventh grade recently got a grant for creating an, an app mm -hmm. that the teachers did and students did. Um, and I, and I'm, and I'm, just, I'm not against the concept Correct. of raising money, I'm just kind of questioning the you know, revenue share splits versus, hey, you like your app, we'll put it on our logo, we'll get access to 20,000 people that Mr. Petrie mentioned. Correct. It sort of feels like that's their investment versus ours, but there should be a cost for us. I don't know. I, you guys go where you want to go. It just feels like it's, I it, have a business where I can get paid for everything I develop in my Right. And, and, you know, part of our hesitation from the <coughs> beginning, in addition to the number of, of advertisement sponsorship locations, was you know, if they can't be, they need to, if we develop more than one app, they need to be able to be integrated together. So we don't want to have, you know, one app for the school district and one app for each building that are not integrated together somehow, because if not, then that just creates more work for everybody. So we didn't, we're, we're taking a small bite of this, and if it doesn't work or whatever, um, we're, we're hoping to roll this out early summer so that we get, you know, a couple months in before school starts again, which means we'll get a good idea of um, what uh, uh, you call the soft rollout. We'll have a soft rollout, so we'll get a good idea of what we're looking at, so that if we're not happy with what's there, then we can shut her down and, and move into a different direction. So technically we're contracting for somebody to develop the app for us. Correct. Thanks. You're welcome. What will be, what, what's the goal of the app, or what's the, uh, what's the target? Well, of well there's, a, the, the <laughs> there, there's a belief by some folks that, you know, and, and it's true to a certain extent, that some web pages are dying because the apps that people are using for those web pages take everything away from the website itself. So they, they're shutting, basically, the website's there, but it's not really used or advertised. They're advertising their apps. And they, there's, a, there's a push out there that, that believes that the apps are the way to go in the future, and that's where everybody's going to be because everybody has a phone or an a, a iPad or a, you know, a tablet of some sort, and the apps work. That's where they, you know, they're, they're designed for those applications. And that's where people will be going rather than to the website. They'll be going to the app. They'll be getting the pushes from the app <coughs> as opposed to having to go out themselves. So whether that's true or not, it's a crystal ball type of thing. And, and that's why we want to start small with just the district app. And really using it just ball. for push notifications. Right. Um, reminders, events. It's not going to be like our Facebook page. We have strategic things that Correct. we can two or three posts a day. We will not be sending two or three push notifications a right. day. We're going to start very small and then just kind of see where our where it leads us um, and how it feels in its use across the district. You know, I think it could grow in any number of directions, but we just aren't really sure yet how right. it'll be used. Um, and it's a district app, not per building. Correct. It is district There's a lot of districts that want to do per building, but we want to do this right. sort of trial and see Correct. how it works just for the district. So it's not necessarily athletics focused or, no. um, or kid focused or, because I'm, I'm just, I mean, just me, I, I probably wouldn't use it. Right. But I know that every kid around has got a phone and they're all over these apps. Right. Um, well, and that's why I said, that's why we'll, 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 we'll get, we'll, we'll know once it's implemented, you know, and, and see how it how it flows because I do think that we get we'll get more out of the younger folks than we do out of the older folks, but you know because 
I, even on my phone a lot of times I'm on a regular website rather than the apps, but that's just because that's what I'm used to and I haven't made that change yet. <laughs> right. And the district did have an app about three years ago um, that linked back to our website, mm -hmm. but we didn't maintain it. There were no push notifications affiliated with it. This will be very deliberate and strategic right. in how we use it for district wide messaging, but again, probably for a younger demographic. Right. And still maintaining then our other channels. They'd all work together. They're all going to be linked together. Right. So do do the uh, ads get paid? I'm sorry. The, the revenue that comes from the ads is that a per view, or uh, is that really not even in our domain? Or well, the the ads are the ads are by by location, by size, and it's a it's the they're paid by for a certain length of time, and then. There's um, for each push notification, there can be ads also. So, and the ads that are on one page are, are um, some of them are, are constant through each other section and some change. So that's why it just depends on, on where it is. Okay. So it's not like a per click kind of thing. Correct, correct. And, uh, okay, thanks. So I'll just be able to get on there and push something out every time. I have to go. <laughs> no. You're going to hide it from me, aren't you? <laughs> yes. Go, Hello, everyone. How are you're, you're, you're no. You are not going to have the password, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Discussion of uh, curriculum and coordinator positions. Yes, that's me. Um, this evening, I am bringing up for discussion that we will be bringing forward a new position curriculum coordinator. Um, this will provide leadership in the development, implementation, and coordination of the district's instructional programs K-12, professional development, and data analysis. Primarily, we are looking with Joyce Ringler retiring, um, that Tammy will oversee all of the curriculum instead of just the um, what Joyce did, um, which would include the third grade guarantee, it would be evaluation of some of the building administrators using our OPEST system, uh, the textbook adoption, implementation and oversight. She will be taking over the resident educator program, oversee district compliance for state and federal programs, and be and continue to be the supervisor of the district um, gifted program. Um, the effective date would be this fall in August as her retirement goes into effect. Uh, Tammy's length of employment would be cut in half from a 260 to a 130 day um, of the year contract with half the salary in which she has now, which is $50,000. And that is all um, up in the air until she passes her criminal background check. <laughs> <laughs> so in short, uh, way back in December, I've talked a little bit about a, uh, slipping my mind now, a containment plan. And that was when Ms. Ringler retired, we weren't going to rehire that position. And since the Tammy was a retiring, we weren't going to rehire that position. But what we need is something in between. Someone that takes care of all these government positions that we have and is going to be out in the building and looking and, and doing some professional development, seeing how our products are going to be used and things like that. So we're hopeful 130 days is enough, and we think right now it will be. So in short, uh, we've captured a savings of one and a half positions. And we'll bring back a half position. Does that make sense? So Tammy's position will not be filled when she retires. Correct. Joyce's position will not be filled. Correct. But there will be a half time position of 130 days to deal with the uh, responsibilities you share. Correct. Is that it? Yes. And the reason I fill that will work are three elementary principles. Um, I'll be able to work with them myself, and then our secondary, uh, Andrea will continue working with them. We have a lot in place now, and Mr. Strickberg should take credit for it. That's been put into place instructionally, so we're in a, in a good spot, and we certainly can't add anything else. We just simply need to get what we have in place working to its fullest potential. So, just a I get confused. So does that mean the two positions that we won't be filling go away and are no longer available? And to recreate those, you have to come back to the board? Correct. Well, we don't, they'll all, the job description will always remain. But if we want to fill those positions, we'll always have to bring that back to the board. But they will not be filled next year. 
is there a two-step process with creating a position versus hiring? And I guess I'm trying to figure out why creating a position is got to make slots. Because right now that position doesn't exist. We don't have that position. So yes, it is a two-tier process. It is. So yes. we present tonight, get your feedback, and we come back to get a yes vote to have that position. Then we hire someone. So it's really a three-step process. So you could do the same thing by modifying the existing positions just as easy without creating one. I, I'm just trying to, you have all these open positions. That, okay, Both just, the positions that are going away, per se, do not fit or capture what she will be doing. Right. So those, we leave them there, but they are not filled. So that way, we would have to come back and say to you, we are looking at refilling her position as the executive director of instruction, if we ever wanted to do that. So we're downsizing the central office, basically, is what we're doing. With the option to the, the, the whole on the organization chart is you still have an organization chart that has the executive director of curriculum. It will, it'll come off of there when we revamp the organizational chart. Okay. Elementary uh, K through preschool through six curriculum will go under me, uh, specifically, even though all of them do, and then seven through 12 will go under Andrew. Ten will be the blue. So we'll get it. <laughs> She said, I'm already blue yeah, duct tape, super blue, you name it. That doesn't mean that three years you need this position. It could, but I don't perceive that happening. Right now, with the state funding where it's at, and clearly our five year forecast, not as solid as it perhaps could be, if we, we have to look at how we can get that That's one way to do it. We haven't really presented a full length plan, but we're working on a step by step. The first phase of it was the first grade transition, and then central office. This is what we see when we do that. But we're not a large central office by any means. Okay, any public participation on the work session items? Discussion of old business or uh, any other business. We don't need to take a session. So we don't need to take a session. Is there a motion? Chairman? Move. So moved. 